Good afternoon. Global warming has been linked to the cars that we drive, the energy supply, and now the food that we buy. From farm to fork, uh, food often travels long distances to reach our plate. The carbon dioxide emissions from these food miles traveled are compounded by the methane produced when food waste is tossed in landfills. We cannot continue in, to spite the land that feeds us. The witnesses before us today are all pursuing sustainable dining options that can alleviate the impact of our food consumption on global warming. The impact is prevalent in the three responsibilities of a dining facility, procurement, consumption, and disposal. Purchasing local food reduces food miles traveled. Using renewable biodegradable plates and utensils reduces oil consumption and waste. Turning table scraps and leftover food into compost returns nutrients, nutrients to farms and reduces global warming. The food Americans eat increasingly comes from greater distances. From 1970 to 1980, our food miles traveled increased from 1,300 to 1,500 miles. A 2002 World Watch Institute report stated that food in the United States traveled uh, between 1,500 and 2,400 miles. The typical American prepared meal contains on average ingredients from at least five countries outside of the United States. By, flavoring more local, by favoring more local fare, the CO2 emissions associated with food travel can decrease significantly. A University of Washington study found that a plate of Washington source foods resulted in 33 percent fewer CO2 emissions than a plate of similar foods from their most popularly imported countries or states of origin. Even if a meal is entirely local, its contribution to global warming con continues after the plates are cleared. Yard trimmings and food waste constitute 24 percent of the U.S. municipal solid waste stream, and half of the garbage at restaurants is estimated to be food waste. As this food rots in a landfill, it produces methane. If that methane escapes into the atmosphere, it traps 20 times more heat than CO2. Food in landfills will continue to contribute to methane emissions. A 2006 study predicted that by 2005, by 2025, food waste will increase by 44 percent worldwide. This methane buildup is deplorable because it is preventable. Food waste can be recycled into compost, resulting in fewer emissions and a new economic product. Compost soil can be used to fertilize crops and landscaping and support green jobs and food waste recycling. The reduced garbage load can result in lower disposal fees as well. Using materials that can be converted to compost further relieves the strain on our landfills and steers facilities away from petroleum-based plastic products. The witnesses before us today have successfully put these principles into use. I look forward to hearing from those witnesses, uh, and I will introduce them at that point in the hearing. The chairman's time has expired. I now turn to recognize the ranking uh, minority member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, today we're talking about the food chain and its impact on greenhouse gas emissions. It seems from the testimony we'll hear today that by making changes to the way food is delivered, prepared, stored, and disposed of, we can create some positive environmental balances. But there are costs associated with these changes. In the long run, these costs may be worth it, or maybe they're not. It points to a larger problem with all things green being sold to us today. One of the projects we'll hear a lot about today is part of Speaker Pelosi's Green the Capital initiative. This project includes many changes to house food service operations, and we welcome Chief Administrative Officer Dan Beard here to talk about them. But do the costs associated with these changes create worthwhile greenhouse gas reductions? Simply put, are we getting the most bang for the buck? Some changes, like serving cage-free eggs or hormone-free dairy, and in Wisconsin we only produce hormone-free dairy, uh, will result in no greenhouse gas reductions whatsoever. One of my four guiding principles in evaluating any global warming policy is will it produce tangible, measurable environmental benefit? The House Food Service project seems to leave that question open, which concerns me. 
If the point is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, could the money spent making wholesale changes to House Food Services be better focused on creating more energy efficiency in the House? It is unclear to me that if there is enough transparency in this process to actually measure if these changes are worth it. Mr. Beard's testimony points toward many simple changes in lighting, heating and cooling that could end up saving the taxpayers $20,000. And that is a good thing. It is just too bad that $89,000 in taxpayers' money apparently gone to a, towards a questionable carbon offsets in an effort for the House to reach its goals of the its Green the Capital initiative. As the Washington Post reported in late January, it seems that some of these offsets are very questionable. The report showed that these offsets produced very little in the way of additionality. That is, it was difficult to show how those taxpayers' dollars did anything to create greenhouse gas reductions that would not have occurred anyway. This article shows to me there needs to be more transparency in dealing with all things green. It seems obvious that there are many opportunities for waste, fraud and abuse or questionable actions to be hidden in a green cloak. Do changes in house cafeteria produce more or better environmental benefits for the dollar than improvements in energy efficiency? Do offsets really produce greenhouse gas reductions and if so, how much? These are questions that both policymakers and consumers should have answers to. Many of the changes talked about today in the food service industry will come down to consumer choice. Living in a carbon-free environment will have significant costs and trade-offs associated with that. It will take consumers and not Congress to tell us if these lifestyle changes are worth it. I thank the Chair. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very, very much for, for being here. And uh, I am uh, extremely interested in uh, having a, a dialogical uh, exchange with you after your presentations. Uh, I am very much interested in uh, sustainable eating sustainable agriculture that, uh, that could separate us from uh, the rest of the world that, frankly, is already ahead of us in so many uh, ways with regard to uh, dealing with uh, the um, greenhouse gases uh, because of, of our geography. I mean, uh, th this, this nation uh, is a mammoth piece of, of property. And uh, I think if, if used wisely, I think we could demonstrate to the rest of the world uh, what uh, kinds of things can be done on a local level uh, that could sustain life and, and the environment at the same time. So I look forward to our uh, exchange later on. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an excellent topic uh, because it illustrates some of the ways or one of the ways that our daily activities that we take for granted contribute significantly to the greenhouse gas issue. Uh, in my district, which includes portions of the San Francisco Bay Area, one of the most interesting uh, approaches I've seen uh, is the grease recycling project in the East Bay. And innovative ideas as such as this are small yet can be effective. Uh, and these are initiatives which will lower greenhouse gas emissions. I'm interested uh, in hearing uh, remarks from uh, Chez Perez Foundation, which is based in the Bay Area, and uh, all of the other witnesses. Thank you very much. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, all time for opening statements from members has expired, although they will be allowed to place their opening statements in the record. We now turn to our panel. Our first witness, Daniel Beard. Is the Chief Administrative Officer for the House of Representatives. Mr. Beard spent 10 years on the staff of the House Appropriations and Natural Resources Committee. Uh, he returned to the Hill uh, at Speaker Pelosi's request to become the Chief Administrative Officer. He is well suited by, to uh, Speaker Pelosi's Green the Capital Initiative and with his extensive background managing environmental issues 
uh, with the Department of Interior and the National Audubon Society. His work on greening the Capitol and the House cafeteria system has been noted by food writers for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, we welcome you, uh, Mr. Beard. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Our goal with the House Food Service operation has been to make it a premier showcase of sustainable, green, and healthy food operations. Um, we have worked closely with our new food service vendor, Restaurant Associates of New York, to implement our changes with each of the 240,000 meals we serve each month in our uh, cafeterias, uh, carryouts, uh, and other facilities. Our highest priority was banning all, uh, the banning of all plastic and styrofoam from the cafeterias. In addition, we wanted to make nearly all of our waste stream compostable. As a result, all of the knives, uh, forks, and spoons which uh, are in use in the cafeteria, as well as our sandwich clamshells, which has a delicious dessert in it, uh, are made from corn-based products. Uh, the plates and coffee cups are from paper, and the entree uh, containers, which I've, are shown here, are uh, made from sugar cane. This material uh, in front of me will become compost in 90 days. Um, the House is demonstrating, I think, with this effort uh, and with every meal that we serve, that there is a market uh, for U.S. manufacturers to provide green, sustainable, uh, recyclable products. Our biodegradable items, for example, come from companies in Maine, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. We send the compost, compostable food service items uh, along with uh, all of the food waste in the front of the cafeteria and from the kitchens to a pulper which, we, which was purchased on the Longworth loading dock. The pulper then breaks down the um, the compost into this material, which looks a lot like uh, coleslaw or a moist uh, confetti. So all of these items, plus all the food from the front and the back of the house, plus um, all these, are then ground into this kind of a mix. It's picked up once a day, uh, and it is sent to suburban compost, uh, compost facilities in suburban Maryland. Two days a week it goes to the Department of Agriculture, three days a week to a commercial composter near Crofton. The result is what you have in 90 days is compost material. And uh, I brought both an example of the compost material as well as the, uh, the start of the, you know, the start of the process as well as the end of the process. Now, while the new operation has only been up and running for 60 days, preliminary results are actually very encouraging. The waste hauler for the landfill picked up 20 tons less material in the last three weeks of December uh, 2007 as compared with 2006. Uh, we are realizing cost savings by hauling and depositing less waste in landfills, and the compost tipping fees are 30 percent less. Uh, than they are at the regular landfills. More important, sending the food service waste to, uh, for compost also reduces our carbon footprint by uh, preventing the conversion to methane, as the chairman mentioned. We are now working to calculate the methane reduction and use the savings as a carbon offset for the house operations. We have also looked at our food, um, the food that we serve. Uh, for sustainability improvements. Our coffee, Pura Vida coffee, is fair trade, shade grown, and organic. Our beef, chicken, and pork are hormone free. The seafood served is certified sustainable by uh, using the Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood uh, guidelines. Under restaurant associates, the amount of fresh produce and meat has increased from 35 percent under the previous vendor. Uh, GSI to 85 percent. This switch to fresher food and the resulting trimmings is, uh, is complemented at the back end with the pulper and the composting solutions that we have implemented. The House is also promoting the buying of food produced in a 150-mile radius uh, from the Capitol where, whenever possible. We are emphasizing the purchase of organically produced food 
and providing a market for new and existing farms and businesses to meet these needs. Uh, this, incidentally, is uh, part of the policy efforts um, and the direction that Restaurant Associates is using its uh, operations in other cities as well. We have made a good start, but we know that there is much more that we have to do to be sustainable, greener, and to continue to reduce our carbon footprint. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer questions at the appropriate point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beard, very much. Um, our next witness is uh, Dr. Patricia Milner, who specializes in environmental microbiology. Her work on microorganisms in composting has significantly influenced the design of large scale composting facilities. She also researches how composted um, spoil can uh, prevent plant disease. Uh, she is a research bi uh, microbiologist in the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Laboratory in the U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture, where our house cafeteria food waste is composted. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Milner. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to present some information on general aspects of composting and the environmental benefits as related to food residuals management and the greening practices. Composting involves a natural aerobic self-heating process in which microorganisms rapidly transform the raw organic materials into humus, which is a critical component for soil health. Management and testing are used throughout this process in order to ensure that the primary goals of nutrient stabilization, pathogen destruction, and odorant elimination are achieved. When finished, compost is mixed with soil, and this helps to reduce erosion from wind and water. Compost also enhances soil structure, root penetration, and very importantly, the water holding capacity of soil. All of these aid in plant growth and increase the resistance to drought, disease, and other stresses. Compost also provides major and minor plant nutrients and can substitute for one-third the amount of nitrogen fertilizer usually required for turf. This means that compost use on lawns in areas like Washington, D.C. and the surrounding metropolitan area can help reduce nutrient runoff that ultimately gets into waterways such as the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay. Composting can also reduce the generation and release of greenhouse gases. Recent estimates indicate that aerobic composting instead of landfilling of food residuals avoids major amounts of methane generation and release. Approximately six metric tons of CO2 equivalent are saved from each metric ton of compost food residuals that are not landfilled. Locally, at the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, we compost 13,000 cubic yards a year of organics from our 6,500-acre farm. In our first picture up here, it gives you an aerial view of our composting site. The long rows are actually the windrows that we use. The second picture shows uh, the compost turner, which is used to, in the process of turning this compost periodically. In recent years, we have composted food residuals mixed with compostable bio-based cafeteria ware from the Witten and South buildings. This activity now includes collectively about 40 cubic yards per week, or six tons, of material from the South Building and the Witten Building, the U.S. House of Representatives Longworth Building Cafeteria, and a commercial organics food retailer. A commercial provider collects and hauls the material 10 miles from D.C. to our site at Beltsville, where it is mixed with sawdust from the Congressional Woodworking Shop, along with leaves and old hay from our farm. This public-private team effort has helped to advance the inclusion of compostable bio-based cafeteria ware. As the seasons progress, we plan to incorporate grass, landscape, and floral trimmings from the congressional grounds, the U.S. Botanical Gardens, and the USDA Headquarters Complex. The residuals from the Longworth cafeteria are notably distinct from the other materials that are collected in that they are pulped, as Mr. Beard has explained. 
This type of processing reduces the haul mass by approximately 70 percent with concurrent per unit haul cost savings, and it facilitates an accelerated decomposition. Our interest in composting food residuals at BARC meshes well with our field scale research studies, which include evaluations of the degradation rate of bio-based cafeteria ware as part of the USDA's biopreferred program. And that includes things like um, this corn-based bottle, which is a water bottle with its uh, chlorine filter uh, attached inside. And there are some other articles that are uh, being passed around the room that are also bio-based. We are also looking at the efficiency of biofiltration on you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from a variety of different kind of composting formats. Alternative uses for excess compost heat are also an important feature of our program. And lastly, we are also always concerned with the safe production of local leafy greens, fresh fruits, and vegetables. Currently, the compost from Beltsville is used for soil improvement on the USDA farm, the U.S. National Arboretum, and the USDA Witten Witt Buildings Gardens. Looking forward, we have engaged with the Maryland Environmental Service, the Maryland Department of Environmental Protection, and members of the U.S. EPA headquarters and Region 3 Food Recycling Work Group to explore and encourage more food composting capacity in the D.C. metro region. To address this need and to avoid long-haul distances, we are pursuing through our cooperative research and development agreements a variety of in-vessel composting and processing op options that include energy recovery and sustainability. In conclusion, um, BARC and other ARS locations continue to press forward with composting and other technologies to increase recycling of agricultural, municipal, and food residuals, to reduce the landfilling of organics, to increase energy capture, and to lessen pollution that threatens our precious natural resources, soil, water, and air. My colleagues and I appreciate the opportunity uh, and the interest of your committee in the issue of recycling food residuals and compostable bio-based products. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we will move now to Dr. Kelly. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify about the essential role of the food service industry in sustainability and the strat strategic value of sustainability to guide food service innovation. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer of the University of New Hampshire, where for the last 10 years I have directed the University Office of Sustainability, the first endowed university-wide program of its kind in the country. The University of New Hampshire is building a culture of sustainability by organizing everything we do around its principles, our curriculum, our operations, our research, and engagement with the wider world. Within our own campus operations, we have been building a low-carbon energy infrastructure that will result in total emissions 57 percent below 1990 levels by this time next year, with no offsets purchased, millions of dollars saved, and energy security enhanced. But our efforts go well beyond that in educating the next generation of citizen professionals to meet the challenges of sustainability. And building a sustainable food system is fundamental to this broader mission. I've included specific examples in my written testimony, including our local harvest initiative that links local and regional procurement with energy and water efficiency and composting, as well as the first organic dairy research farm at a land-grant university in the United States. But for my purposes uh, for speaking, I'd like to share four principles and five broader recommendations with you that we have found to be important in building a sustainable food service at the Univers University of New Hampshire. And all of these are about business not as usual, but about collaborations and partnerships that cut across virtually every well-established boundary between disciplines, management functions, and internal and external stakeholders. First, a comprehensive approach to food system sustainability must address the important role played by the food service industry, and I applaud your actions here today to do just that. The food service industry is an increasingly important actor in the chain that links agriculture, the environment, and public health. In addition to minimizing their own 
direct operational impacts, sustainability practices within the food service industry can create greater demand for sustainable agriculture from the local to the global level while providing healthy, delicious cuisine that nourishes the palate and the spirit. This means that the sustainable food system advocates from all sectors must engage the food service industry in these broader efforts. Second, a comprehensive approach to building a sustainable food service industry must see that industry as part and parcel of the larger food system. A successful approach must go beyond food counter to compost, as this hearing is entitled, to embrace the entire food system cycle, from healthy soils to healthy farm and food enterprises to healthy communities, including composting operations, that in turn help build healthy soils and so the cycle continues. We cannot truly have a sustainable food service industry unless we have a sustainable food system from farm to fork to compost to food security and nutritional health. This means that the sustainable food service advocates and enterprises need to actively engage with partners from agriculture, resource conservation, and nutrition to add their unique and critical contribution to this larger shared goal. Third, a comprehensive approach to building a sustainable food industry must see the food system as part of the larger society in which it operates. In our communities, food, agriculture, and nutrition are linked and inseparable from climate and energy, biodiversity and ecosystems, and to regional economies and livable wages. All of these factors interact to impact our public health and quality of life. This is the province of sustainable communities and the larger goal of sustainable development. Within a given food service operation, sustainability means thinking up and down the supply chain and across the life cycle of its products and services and out into the communities and regions that are working to sustain a quality of life. Finally, in addition to incorporating sustainability practices into our food service industry, it is critically important that these practices are seen as an integral part of education and learning within a broader culture of sustainability. In higher education, sustainable food practices must be complemented by curriculum, research, and public engagement that strengthens sustainable food systems in our communities. By cultivating the capacity of students in all fields to advance sustainability in their civic and professional lives, we can ensure that the goals of energy independence and climate stabilization benefit from and contribute to the equally important goals of food security and environmental and public health. Education is the key to empowering and inspiring the creative problem solving that can sustain an improving quality of life for all Americans. What is common to all these efforts that we are engaged in related to food, energy, and the environment and quality of life is collaboration built around shared goals that are in everyone's interests. Those shared interests lie in the fact that reducing greenhouse gas emissions, so-called mitigation, is absolutely necessary but insufficient to address the issue. We must simultaneously adapt to regional impacts of an already changing climate by building resilience into the systems that sustain our communities, including food systems. So uh, four, five points just to uh, uh, summarize here in closing that these, we think, are based on our experience, principles that could help guide a national policy framework. One, support regional approaches to food and agriculture that reflect the diversity of ecology and culture and the opportunities. Two, link food and farming to health, nutrition, and poverty reduction. Three, support research for sustainable approaches to biofuels that must reflect the best scientific assessments across the full life cycle of those fuels. Fourth, support responsive land-grant universities. We have a marvelous network in place, including Cooperative Extension, that can really contribute to these uh, problems and solutions. And finally, support sustainability science uh, with the recognition from the National Research Council and National Academy of Sciences of the importance of responsive science. I thank you again for the opportunity and look forward to discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Let, let me uh, apologize. Uh, the, the sounds you heard uh, were aimed at getting us over to the Capitol uh, to cast four votes. Um, and, and time is running out for us to get there. Uh, is it possible for you to stay until we can return? Um, I would say 20 five minutes. Yeah. Approximately 25 minutes. Uh, I, I hate to do this. Congress is manic depressive, and it's, w w this is not a sustainable way of doing business. But 
but this is the way it is. So we would appreciate it very much if you could stay, and we will get back immediately after the last vote is cast. Thank you. And Ms. Wong, we'll start with you. Again, you're a good segment. <laughs> right, Tom Kelly, Karina, Kelly. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're at the Chez Panisse Foundation? Yes, I run the Foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I met Alice.
I apologize again. We ended up in a debate and then didn't even get a chance to take the last vote. Um, so. And so we, we are ready to resume. I, I, I can't apologize enough, but Ms. Wong, if you would proceed. And we'd probably be joined uh, as people are coming across the street. It's raining, so they're going underground. Great. Thank you. I come here today as the executive director of the Shea Penise Foundation, and more importantly, as the mother of two young children. When you have children, you begin to worry about a lot of things, and what they eat or food is one of them. The Chez Panisse Foundation gets its name from a restaurant that wholly supports two farms and 85 others by buying locally, seasonally, and sustainably. It was started by a woman named Alice Waters. Alice is the founder, also the founder of the Chez Panisse Foundation. We're a separate nonprofit, and our work is to support educational programs that use food to educate, empower, and nurture youth to build a more sustainable future. Twelve years ago, we started an organic kitchen and garden program at a public middle school to build a model that would change the way children relate to food. We wanted to show them how their food choices have both an impact on their health, the community, and the environment. Today, the Edible Schoolyard is a program in which every child participates in growing, harvesting, cooking, and sharing food at the table. Children learn about where their food come from, comes from and math, reading, and writing. They learn about proportionality with recipes and science with soil experiments and history through ancient grains that they harvest. They turn the compost pile and their scraps from the kitchen classroom go into it. The original vision for the Edible Schoolyard was to include a school lunch program for all students. Not just a healthy lunch, but a delicious one that's made from local, seasonal, and sustainable ingredients. Our schools in Berkeley, like other schools in America before we started this work, were serving frozen grilled cheese sandwiches in packages. Something called Inchoritos, which I'm still not sure what they are, and chicken fingers that no doubt had traveled what is that typical 1,500 miles to get to our cafeteria. So we funded a chef to work inside the school district to begin to make changes, not just taking the bad things out, but focusing on buying locally. It was an important part of our strategy and our vision. Lots of districts are trying to change their food and take fat out or lower the sugar, but they're not looking at their local sourcing. And we knew that local, seasonal, and sustainably grown foods would be better for the environment, and they would simply taste better for kids. Ripe, juicy tomatoes in the late summer, tangerines in the winter, apples in the fall, lettuces in the spring. We have vision they would lure children into our cafeterias. But could the district, a public school district, afford these changes? They had a policy that said they should do it, but would they really do it? So two and a half years later, we have a salad bar in every school, much of which is organic, free breakfast for all students and organic milk at lunch. 30% of our produce is organic and actually regionally or locally procured. We compost and recycle in all of our kitchens, 16 of them, and have moved away from metal containers to serving buffet style with compostable trays and in some schools, real plates. The foundation does not pay for any of the food costs. We supported the cook in the development of new menus, procurement systems, and an evaluation. It sounds quite simple. Buy locally and make real food. It's as right as rain. But we face many challenges. Can you imagine that when we started, we had to teach people who were making the food how to use a knife? Can you imagine that we don't have a stove in our central kitchen that serves 5,000 meals a day? Can you imagine that we couldn't even buy from a farmer from the farmer's market because we had no place to store his or her produce and no way to purchase directly from them? And finally, what do you think you can make for lunch that's nourishing and delicious, that's less than a dollar? Despite these challenges, we've made progress, and I do believe it can be done in other places. For school districts, it requires more incentives and better policies. When fruit cocktail meets nutritional guidelines set by the USDA, I think we have a problem. We need stronger language in the Farm Bill to support local purchasing of all food, not just fruits and vegetables, and we need investments or loans to help farmers grow real food, broccoli instead of just corn for corn syrup. We need pilot programs to show that this can be done in other parts of the country, both the lunch piece and the education piece. And we need more funding for food. We have to stop thinking of food as cheap. Jamie Oliver, I was recently with him, another chef from the UK, held up an iPod and he said, 
Would you want to buy this iPod if it just cost $20? No, you'd question where it came from and you'd question what it was made of. We should be thinking about the same thing with food for our children. Do we really want to buy the cheapest beef? The beef recall, the largest in history with 173 million pounds of beef, should be a lesson to us. We need more funding for training in school gardens because we've learned at the Edible Schoolyard, if they grow it and cook it, they absolutely will eat it. Finally, it requires leadership at all levels of government and in our schools. Budgets are tight, but we can pay now or pay later. I don't need to tell you about the obesity crisis facing our children and the CDC telling us that this generation will be the first to die younger than its parents. I end with how I introduced myself as a mother who cares about what kind of world my children will live in. Children learn eating habits when they're very, very young. And I have a son that is one and a daughter that's three. Fortunately, my daughter loves peas. She saw a basket of them recently at Chez Panisse and asked to take a handful of them out of the restaurant with her. And as we left, said, more, mama, more. But at the same time, she goes to a daycare center in Oakland where there's a lunch subsidized by the federal government that, sends, that gives her fish sticks and chocolate pudding for lunch. There's something wrong with this picture when a mother tries to do the right thing, but the government sends a different message. I'm so honored to be here testifying before this committee. It means that government, our leaders, are connecting the dots between the food system and the environment, between our children's health and the health of this economy. What we feed our children matters. The National Lunch Program serves 31 million children a day, and we have a choice about what to feed them. Thank you for connecting your efforts to create energy independence and stop global warming with our efforts to make a very simple meal, lunch, more delicious and locally grown for children. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Wong, very much. Um, yes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for a round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Baird, uh, I came up, to, uh, returned to Washington on this past um, Sunday night and came to my office at about 11 o'clock at night, which is just a slight symbol of the fact that I have no life. <laughs> but what I was concerned when I arrived, see that there are very that that would be a subtle suggestion that maybe we ought to do something in our, in our offices um, and, and even in our district offices. Now, I have a, uh, I have a mobile unit uh, in, in my district in, in, in Missouri, in Kansas City, Missouri, that where well, we have a, a mobile unit that runs off of grease. And we, we, we get the grease, of course, uh, at restaurants. And so it ends up being recycled. And you cook a Big Mac in it, we, we drive. Uh, with it, uh, but but I think as we're trying to get the nation uh, to even think about uh, sustainability uh, of of uh, our um, our food supplies, uh, our uh, dining, 
that maybe we are we we, we need some moral authority to to to, uh, to make those pronouncements, and I'm not sure we do have that based on what's going on on the Hill right now. Okay, do you have any ideas or suggestions? Yes, I do, um, Mr. Cleaver. I I happen to think that what we need to have is a night lighting policy. I you know we we need to. Um, uh, direct that the lights in the offices be turned off at a reasonable hour, whatever that may be, um, until we can go back and retrofit all the offices with motion detector lights. Uh, we don't really have any choice other than to mechanically flick those, uh, make sure that direct that those lights are turned off. Um, the system that's currently used by the architect of the Capitol is to uh, have the cleaning crews, as they leave, turn off all the lights. Um, but uh, that's an inconsistent uh, pattern, doesn't work. I think a better solution would be to work with the architect of the Capitol Direct to implement a night lighting policy. We've already worked with the architect to reduce the run time on the fans, for example, uh, for the heating and cooling systems, where we've reduced the run time by 14 percent, which in turn has reduced, you know, having an impact on uh, our carbon footprint and our overall operations. Uh, we're also trying to install better controls so that we don't lose, uh, that we aren't running the air conditioning systems, you know, 24 7 at a very low uh, temperature. So I, I happen to think the easiest thing, uh, the, the easiest way to get about this is to work with the architect of the Capitol to come up with a night lighting policy so that we turn those lights off. Uh, and if, if a member is there and wants them on, all they got to do is flick the switch, but otherwise they're off and uh, we ought to make sure that they are off. It, there's a significant savings that can be had, you know, both in, um, uh, in terms, well, in terms of carbon and, and the costs of electricity. Now, we, we at one point, when this committee first uh, began its work, we had the largest carbon footprint in, in Washington. Capitol Hill did. Is that still the case, and if so, um, how do we expand what you're doing? I, I'm not all sure we have the largest car carbon footprint in Washington, but uh, you, you have to remember uh, the 7,000 employees of the House of Representatives that are here in, in Washington on this campus uh, are do business in uh, very old structures. I mean, the Capitol is 1793, finished in 1810. And our newest building is Rayburn Building, 1965, so it's 42 years old. Um, you know, Ford is 1939, Longworth 1933, and, and the Cannon Building is 1908. Now, each one of those buildings was built to the fire, safety, health, heating and cooling standards of their day. And we've had to go back and retrofit every one of them. Some buildings, like the Capitol, leak like a sieve. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. It's, uh, and that's just because it, we've had a hodgepodge development. So we have very old, very aging infrastructure that for a long time no one made any improvements in the heating and cooling systems, uh, the metering, or any of the, the other aspects of building operations. So we have a long ways to go to be able to address that. Our carbon footprint of 91,000 tons for a community, a small city of 7,000 people uh, in the district is probably larger than normal, but I don't think that it's too outrageously high. Um, there are other bigger institutions like Georgetown and GW, and, but most of them have uh, buildings that are a lot newer than ours. Ours don't change very much, frankly. Thank you. Yeah. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself for a round of questions. Mr. Beard, what was your uh, most difficult challenge in uh, attempting to green the Capitol? <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. I think um, um, 
getting our, uh, there were really two big problems. The first was getting our arms around all the, the factual situation. What is our carbon footprint? Luckily, the General Accounting Office has been asked to prepare that information um, a couple of years ago, and they made it available to us. So that solved that problem. Um, I think the second problem has been uh, getting people to realize that they have to do business in a different way. That's everything from members and other agencies like the Architect of the Capitol or the Senate or Capitol Police or whoever it may be, and to our employees. Um, we need to do business in a different way, but it isn't that expensive, it isn't that difficult, uh, and it certainly doesn't take new technology. It's all off the shelf and we're not doing anything different than any other major corporation or institution in America is doing at the present time. Um, Walmart or you know, Harvard or any, you know, any company worth its salt is investing in energy efficient, mm -hmm. making energy efficient improvements to affect the bottom line. Are there any other commercial cafeterias that close the loop for procurement, consumption and disposal as the house cafeteria does? Um, I don't know of any in the Washington, D.C. area. Rutgers University has a very good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Harvard, um, Harvard, um, uh, the Harvard um, Business School has one, um, and Google, uh, both in San Francisco, or in the Bay Area as well as in New York, uh, has pretty modern facilities. Um, but I don't know of any others in the D.C. area that have taken the kind of steps that we have. So, and how have you been able to create a corporate model sustainable cafeteria without a price premium? Well, it does cost a little bit more, but I, I'm convinced that you make it up on the back end by increased sales. Um, we run our, uh, you know, our restaurant is, is a commercial operation, if I can put it in those terms. We have a vendor. Uh, the vendor uh, prepares the meals, sells the food, and then we make, uh, the house uh, receives a payment as a percentage of those sales. So the more meals we serve, the more money we make, in a, in a sense, if I can use that analogy. Um, last year we, um, we returned, uh, we received $275,000 in revenues under GSI. We anticipate that will go up to a million to this year with Restaurant Associates, primarily because we're, we're, we're presenting a better product uh, and in a better environment. And the food is better, it's fresher, and uh, we're getting, um, on a per capita basis, greater attendance at the cafeteria than we've had in the past. I don't know how that will work out, you know, six months from now, but certainly it goes back to the, to the, um, to the testimony that we received about the school children and caf school cafeterias. It's not that difficult. It's very easy, to, you know, it's... It, you want to put on the best, you want to make available the best product you can to the employees who work here uh, and to the members um, and to our guests uh, that we possibly can. Um, and if we're willing to invest a, a little bit to do that, uh, we'll get money back on the back end. It cost us, for example, $90,000 um, to purchase and install uh, the pulper but we will make that money back uh, uh, over probably a six-year period of time. Mm -hmm. I think it was a good investment. Mm -hmm. So in the end, though, it is not a price premium, if you think no, I, as, I, I don't uh, think over no. a life cycle. It may be the first year, but the second, third, fourth, and fifth year, it's not. It's not. Uh, Dr. Milner, um, in the Beltsville composting facility operating, is that operating at capacity? Uh, yes, at the present time we are. It's, we're actually uh, expanded ourselves a little bit more than we originally intended, but with some uh, additional modifications and some processes with the in-vessel systems, we're able to handle things. How many facilities like that are there in the United States? Uh, composting facilities in general? I'm going to think that there might be about four or 5,000 total a lot of these don't handle food composting particularly. They, most of them handle yard trimmings and that sort of thing. You discussed um, new facilities to avoid long-haul distances. Yes. 
What are the constraints of finding a location for a composting facility? Um, well, there are actually quite a few. Uh, most of them center around community concerns about potential uh, aspects of maybe there might be some odor or maybe there might be some additional traffic or the aesthetic appearances of an outdoor composting facility where you see the piles and, and that sort of thing instead of in an enclosed in-vessel type of system. So what are the opportunities for expansion? Well, in an urban area, what we're looking at is an, there are a variety of different in-vessel systems that are uh, available within the United States. And so that's what we're looking at is what is the most efficient type of system for the food type operations, and particularly how do they compare with regard to gaseous emissions that impact mm -hmm. the uh, global warming? And what are their energy costs for operating them? Because they obviously do utilize some kind of forced aeration, and so that has to be taken into account. So can you, can you answer that? Can you deal with that question for a second? What are the expenses related to composting? Uh, the expenses are the capitalization. If you're talking about a brand new facility, they have to get a facility up and going and whatever is required for permitting of that facility. And then there's operations and maintenance costs in addition to any of the capital items for the equipment that you need to purchase to move the materials around. And how commercially profitable is the compost after it has been processed? Uh, that depends on what they decide to do in the beginning. I, I often tell people you have to start with the end in mind. In that, in that regard, I say that if you're really looking to produce a very high-end horticultural product, then you need to do certain things in the steps in making that product to get to that very high end. And you can ask a very large price for that because horticultural producers want a reliable, high-quality product. If, on the other hand, you're producing a product that you're just using for general uh, field application mm -hmm. for corn or, mm -hmm. or some other commodity, you may not need to go to that high of an end to produce a high-quality product. And, and, you, and consequently, you don't have to put as, in as much capital investment. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Wong, what aspects of the school lunch initiative ha has the greatest influence on children, in your opinion? I think the greatest aspect of it is a simple example are salad bars. Just having fresh local produce where kids can see and choose. Kids like to choose things. So when they see it, um, they want to eat it. Uh, and it really makes a difference in, in both their health and the environment. Are you interested in expanding to other school districts? Absolutely. We're always looking for different partners, and we've been contacted by folks in Chicago and New York and Los Angeles. While we may not run the programs, we're a very small organization. We absolutely support and are trying to link up funders to support this kind of program in other school districts. Uh, well, let me ask this question to any of you down there. What, what, um, what has been the response from diners as you move to this new uh, uh, model. What, what are you hearing back from the people who consume this food? Well, I, um, <laughs> speaking for the, for the House anyway, um, when the New York Times uh, food critic came uh, to taste the food, after tasting the food, she walked around and talked to people in the, uh, randomly talked to people in the Longworth cafeteria. Uh, she came back and said, well, that was a surprise. And I said, uh, what was? And she said, the number one answer I got back was people were excited about being able to participate in a composting exercise. <laughs> uh, they like the food, but it's just as important that, they're, that we're composting. Um, so I think that was, um, to me at least, one uh, real testament. Uh, I also judge the number of negative emails I get. Um, usually when we make some kind of change around here, uh, I get a lot. Um, I, I guess it's part of the job. But I would have to tell you that I haven't received any bad emails. Um, I've received emails about we need additional information on uh, various aspects and problems with people with special diets. But I haven't received, I have yet to receive an email where somebody said this is lousy food. 
So, uh, Ms. Ms. Wong, have you re what, what kind of comments are, are you receiving from diners? Um, in, our, in our kitchen classroom, which doesn't serve lunch, but kids make a dish and they grow the food, I can tell you on countless occasions I've been in there and seen young um, boys and girls devouring plates of Swiss chard and kale. Um, how many times have you seen that? And I see it every time I go down there in the winter um, because they've been involved in growing and cooking it, and it tastes good because it's straight from their garden that they have been um, growing it. Another story is one of the programs we implemented was a, a free breakfast program. So we source apples and other fruits and vegetables locally from the farmer's market. Um, one, teachers can do it or not do it, but it's available to all of the kids. And at one school in particular, uh, there was a classroom, one teacher was too lazy to go down and get the food in the cafeteria and bring it back up. And one of the young students called the food service director and said, why is everyone else getting this great free breakfast with this fruit and this muffins? And I don't have it. Um, so students really are noticing differences. The longest line in the high school is the salad bar line. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. If I could interject, Mr. Chairman, I would also have to say that, at least in our case, uh, the best test is a market test. Uh, and, you know, we have long lines and a lot of people, um, people coming back and um, the use of the cafeteria is greater now than it was uh, when we compare it back to a year ago. So you're saying that the, yeah. the, the, the revenues are up? Revenues are up and more people are eating and they're satisfied customers, which is ultimately the, the strongest test. You don't usually go back for another bad meal at a restaurant. It's <laughs> <laughs> been my experience. <laughs> you get only one chance. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I agree with that. So that's a, that is quite a tribute. Um, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you picked up where, uh, on a point that I think is, is very important in terms of customer satisfaction. And I, I appreciate, Mr. Beard, um, that you've got a big operation, lots of, uh, of moving parts that you're, that you're dealing with, but you're already seeing, as your testimony pointed out, cost savings uh, just in the area of solid waste. Uh, customer satisfaction and more people actually uh, taking advantage of the healthier, more environmentally sensitive uh, areas. Do you have a sense of where we're going forward, what the cost implications of that will be over time? I and mean, I noticed you, you referenced uh, the $20,000, right. I say, just as one little example. Well, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if overall we're going to be up around a couple of hundred thousand dollars in savings just in um, the kind of investments we've made in um, going back and, and uh, energy efficient equipment in the, uh, the changes in the tipping fees. Um, we also are not going to be purchasing as much carbon offsets, so uh, that's a saving. So uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised at the end of a year uh, we'll reach a couple hundred thousand dollars in savings. I, I, it's not unusual. Well, I would add, add my voice to what you were saying. You didn't, uh, how uh, uh, positive the transition has, has been. You don't usually see that when you're talking about changes, and particularly when there are a few people who've uh, decided to be cranky before they even saw it. Um, <laughs> I have been stunned at just the chatter uh, as I dip down in there for a few minutes to try and grab something, the positive feedback from our office with the young men and women on the Hill that we come in contact with and with visitors. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that I don't think has been given proper attention, but we have millions of visitors mm -hmm. who are on Capitol Hill every year and the opportunity to watch the modeling and the feedback that they get um, is an opportunity to help us carry that message. Um, and to this point, uh, based on uh, the feedback from my constituents and the folks we pick up on, it's been very positive and I appreciate it. I would pose a question to you, Mr. Beer, or our other panelists, uh, about the lessons that um, this suggests for other areas of the federal government. I think it's important for, for us to uh, model the behavior we want from the rest of America on Capitol Hill, but the federal government is the largest landlord landowner, employer, probably the largest provider of food services in the United States. As you sort of run this all out, um, 
pretty significant potential impact. And I wondered if any of you had thoughts or observations about uh, from these lessons about what changes we should have in federal policy to be able to accelerate this change um, to capture these savings and increase customer satisfaction. Do you want to go ahead? Um, I, I mentioned earlier in my testimony the Farm Bill is now in conference, but there are things in it that encourage and provide incentives for purchasing locally. So those are important pieces of legislation that need to be strengthened, um, as well as encouraging loans for farmers to really begin to produce real food. Those are two very strong examples that I think, um, policy-wise, that support our efforts. I'll, I'll send you my Food and Farm Bill of Rights legislation. Uh, Terrific. Some of which I'm, got into the Farm Bill. I'm sure I'll agree with it. Yeah. Well, I think my observation would be it isn't that hard. Uh, we're not talking about rocket science here. This isn't brain surgery or anything. Uh, we're talking about going to local, obtaining locally produced um, products uh, and providing fresh food uh, to our customers. I, I really have to put in a plug for our, um, our vendor. Restaurant Associates has been a fantastic vendor uh, for the house. I met with the president of uh, Restaurant Associates in November and I told him that Success to me would be uh, that in a year people would come to, the, uh, to Washington, D.C. and say, we have to go to the House of Representatives <laughs> cafeteria because it's a green and a sustainable operation. And I think we're almost there. I mean, I, fr I think, frankly, if uh, uh, some more publicity like this hearing, um, it will be, um, we, we will be um, having a, that kind of an impact. But it really isn't that hard. It doesn't cost that much more, um, and um, you make the money back on, on, you know, in the long term by by having uh, uh, greater revenues. So, uh, I guess the other thing in terms of of policy, I think the suggestions about the farm bill are very, uh, very interesting, and very worthwhile. We've actually made these changes, incidentally, without uh, the benefit of getting as many products from local providers as we would like to have because of the time of the year we're in. Uh, but I think when you see in the spring and the fall here, um, you will see a lot fresher products, uh, our apples, um, peaches and other kinds of things that you'll see will be local products. If you, as you walk into the Longworth Cafeteria, for example, or Rayburn, you'll notice a little sign and it said our local partners and what what it shows is the local farms that are supplying food that day. And I've talked to restaurant associates about having some of those farmers come into the restaurants uh, and, you know, talk some about the kinds of things that they're doing and their products so it can build a link between our cafeterias and um, our suppliers, the farms that we are using. So there's a lot of exciting things that we can do, and Restaurant Associates has been more than willing to participate in that. Super. Thank you. I, I would just say, um, and there's hardly a week that goes by when I don't receive a call about other, from other federal uh, agencies around here in the Washington metropolitan area who would like to be able, they're interested in doing the composting of food residuals and trying to get on board with the bio-based um, bio products. So there's a, I, I think there's a huge pent-up demand among the federal agencies to do that. And as soon as there's more composting capacity for food waste in the area, I can see that going forward rather rapidly. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, I thank the gentleman from Oregon. Here's what I'm going to ask now each one of you to give us your best one-minute summary of what you want us to remember uh, about this uh, phenomenon uh, so that we can uh, retain that in our uh, minds and feel free to use uh, the props which you brought as part of your summation. Uh, Ms. Wong, we'll begin with you. One minute. I'd like to give a quote from my organization's founder. I think this sums it up. Alice Waters said, I believe there is something very wrong with the way most, of our, most people in our culture relate to food. And this is something that seems to me to be absolutely central to the future of environmentalism. 
Even the environmental visionaries who seem to be seeing the trees awfully well, even some of these brilliant revolutionaries keep missing the forest. And the forest is that learning to make the right choices about food is the single most important key to environmental awareness for ourselves and for our children. Great. Thank you, Ms. Wong, very much. Uh, Dr. Milner. Um, I would just sum up by saying that composting is Mother Nature's natural process for decomposing and recycling. And it starts and ends there. Beautiful. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Beard. I, I think I'd use a little bit of a variation of that. Again, you know, we start um, with the food itself and, and the materials move to uh, our compost material, um, you know, our, I guess I call it my coleslaw, uh, <laughs> leading us into compost. So it is a life cycle. Uh, and you have to think about it in life cycle terms and look at this uh, in a much more c comprehensive uh, fashion. And then I, I think the last thing that I would say is that I would encourage you to visit the members' dining room, uh, the Longworth or uh, Rayburn cafeterias, um, and uh, Bon Appetit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank I you. Am, I am doing that, and it is really great, and I want to congratulate you. Thank and, you. Uh, and, you know, we are daily diners. Um, but I think uh, our members might want to try, try uh, Chez Panisse, too. That might be a good <laughs> might be a congressional us. trip for us. Yeah. Um, we thank you all very much. Uh, thank you. For this thank you. This hearing is adjourned.